At 29, Linnell Barsock was, as they say, upwardly mobile. Very successful. Here's a young girl, she's 29 years old, a very attractive girl. She's got a career going for herself. She's a licensed vocational nurse, has a beautiful home, about 36, 3,700 square feet. Linnell had a boyfriend, a native of Haiti named Louis Bonware. Louis had a very hot temper, a very jealous guy. He would uh, often uh, go to the point of actually stalking his own girlfriend. He would follow her to work and it actually followed her in his car and it actually drove her, drove her off the road, causing her vehicle to crash. Linnell kept her romantic options open. She was also seeing a guy named Ike Omuna. One scorching hot June day in Palmdale, California, 65 miles northeast of Los Angeles where Linnell lived, her pal Lorraine Austin stopped by. She had planned to weave Linnell's hair that day, but she walked into a firestorm. Lewis was in a rage. Lewis found out that not only did uh, his girlfriend Linnell have her regular phone, but she had a phone given to her by this other boyfriend. Lorraine decided to come back later, hoping things would calm down. When she returned, it was calm, dead calm. She saw her friend laying on the garage floor next to the car. Linnell had a black plastic bag around her head, so Lorraine wasn't able to identify her face. She immediately uh, checked for a pulse on Linnell's foot and didn't find one, then walked over to the, to the head and lifted up the plastic bag to confirm that was her friend, and indeed it was. It was a, has a beautiful home, about 36, 3,700 square feet. She heard movement on the second floor of the house, and the next thing she knew, she was staring Louis Bonware in the face as he stood at the top of the stairs. Immediately, Lorraine thought, that is the killer. He's here, he just killed my friend, and now he saw me, he knows who I am, he's gonna kill me. Lorraine ran for her life, speeding off in her car, headed for the sheriff's station. When Lorraine Austin came into the Palmdale Sheriff's Station, she was hysterical. She was very agitated, was yelling that her friend had been murdered, wanted assistance. She had blood on her hands, she had blood among her fingernails, she had blood on the pant legs, on her knees, and on her buttocks area and on her chest. Now she explained that as having wiped herself after she had fallen onto the cement floor in the garage. It didn't take long for cops to catch up with Bonware. Lewis appeared to be the killer based on several factors. Lewis tells us that their relationship is very good. That does not jive with anything that we've heard from any of the people that we've interviewed at that point. I noticed that he had a scratch on the left side of his cheek. He started crying, but I saw no tears. Our victim's brother indicated that he saw Lewis on, on the computer looking for flights to Miami as well as making banking transactions and we figured he was trying to fund his, his escape to Haiti. And if the motive wasn't clear enough, the writing was on the wall. A Dear John letter from Liddell. The Dear John letter started off with saying, Dear Lewis, I am leaving you for another guy that I've been dating for the last four months named Ike. Don't try to find me. Lewis Bonware was taken into custody. The next order of business, finding the physical evidence that would seal his fate. We know that the victim was shot in the back of the head, slightly downward angle. And the exit wound was through the nose. We found a pillow that had been used as a silencer. Uh, evidently, the pillow had been placed to the back of our victim's head when she was shot in the back of the head in order to muff the noise of the gunshot. Cops find an expended cartridge from a 9 millimeter gun. This is similar to what I found at the crime scene. Sheriff senior criminalist Mary Keynes makes her own telling observations at the bloody crime scene in the garage. There was a lot of blood throughout the entire crime scene, but it had been moved around and cleaned up significantly. Mary uses luminol to essentially light up blood the human eye can't see. This is an actual photo of the crime scene. She determines Linnell had been murdered in the home and moved to the garage. The luminol fluoresced and you could see an area that looked like somebody had been dragged through that location. Keynes collects, among other things, a gray plastic pitcher with a distinct fingerprint, which Keynes believes was used to clean up the crime scene, a bloody pair of gloves, and an area rug near Linnell's body that had been removed from the home. She works to process the crime scene evidence, while detectives work on Louis Bonware, who's being held in the county jail. He kept telling us, you've got to help me, you've got to help me. 
and we were like, how so? He says, you've got to find the murderer. And in my mind, I thought, I'm looking at the murderer. Now, one of the things that Louis Bonier had told us during the interview um, is that he was not in the Palmdale area at all that day, that he had left at around noonish um, to get his car fixed in the Los Angeles area. And when we asked him, where were you? Can you verify where you were? He told us that he had gone to several auto body stores. The detectives check out Lewis's story, and they're stunned at what they find. We're searching the truck. We're looking for evidence of what we believe is his involvement in the murder. Uh, that's not what we find. Instead, what we found was, was auto receipts and bank receipts that show that he was in the south central area of Los Angeles when this murder should have been taking place. Surveillance footage from two Los Angeles auto parts stores 65 miles away from Palmdale clearly show Louis Bonware. So now we know that there's no way that he could have committed the murder. He was totally innocent because he was in, as of 1240, he left. And we have video evidence. Cell phone records also put Lewis in Los Angeles. You can't be in South Central Los Angeles, get to Palmdale, come back to Central Los Angeles, not unless you have your own private jet. And even then, it would be difficult. The investigation takes a sharp turn. Detectives Kenny and Espino have cleared Linnell's other boyfriend, Ike Umuna. So if they didn't kill her, who did? If her boyfriend didn't do it, who did? Then, a shocker. The detectives find Linnell also liked women. And they turn their attention to Lorraine Austin, who first reported the murder, Linnell's so-called best friend. In fact, detectives find the two had just met. Lorraine Austin was very involved in Craigslist. Uh, she was involved in the personal sections, the women seeking women. We know via the phone records that Lorraine Austin was dating three people at the time of the murder, our victim and two other ladies, and they were having a sexual lesbian relationship with all three women. She was also communicating with three other women through Craigslist. It was on Craigslist that Lorraine connected with Linnell just one month before her murder. Lorraine befriended her, they developed a romantic relationship, and I'm confident that Lorraine was hoping that she would move in with Linnell and life would be happy forever after. But after just three weeks of a whirlwind affair, Linnell told Lorraine she was going to focus on just one love, Louis Bonware. Cops now have a hunch. Lorraine, a woman with no job and heavily in debt, was not happy about being dumped. I think when she hooked up with Linnell, she saw, my ticket is here. This is how I'm going to get what I want and what I deserve. Espino and Kenny ask Lorraine to take a polygraph. She promises but puts them off. Then cops discover... She'd been researching online on the internet various ways to defeat the polygraph. The detective's suspicion soon turned into hard evidence as criminalist Mary Keene's results are in. That pair of bloody gloves? Some of the DNA came from Lorraine Austin. So it gave a strong indication that she was wearing these black gloves at one time, um, which puts her hands at the crime scene. That gray plastic pitcher? The container with the bloody fingerprint came back, and it came back as the fingerprint belonging to Lorraine Austin. And what about that goodbye letter to Lewis signed by Linnell Barsock? That Dear John letter was actually written by Lorraine Austin. It was a, it was a fake. It was forged. She actually wrote that out and placed it in the crime scene. And finally, inside that rolled up area rug found near Linnell's body, several hair weaving needles. Remember, Lorraine was going to style Linnell's hair that day. When detectives piece it all together, they've got motive, means, and opportunity. The victim was having her hair weaved, and Lorraine was standing directly behind her. And the suspect reached over, grabbed a pillow, used it as a silencer, put the gun up to the pillow, pushed down, shot her once in the back of the head. She got angry, she was jilted, and she decided that she wanted what she felt she was owed. And she took it, including Linnell's life. Cops believe Lorraine dragged the victim's body to the garage, hoping to get it into the car with a plan to dump Linnell in the desert. She was gonna kill Linnell, take her car, 
take her jewelry, any money that she might have, possibly some of the uh, large screen brand new television sets, and sell them and make at least a little money. When Lorraine couldn't lift the body into the car, she resorted to plan B, blame it on Lewis. Lewis may in fact have been a jealous guy, but he was no murderer. Lorraine's entire story was a lie. And now that the game was up, Lorraine took off and stayed on the lam for a year until she was finally found hiding out in, of all places, Belize. When Espino and Kenny catch up with their long sought killer, she was as coy as ever. How was my trip? And how did I end up there? We're just curious more than anything else. Mm. I went. Don't vacation, you know. Like normal people do, go exploring and live life. So, decided to go do some traveling. So, that's what I did. Lorraine had nothing to confess. But she did complain that the media dared to portray her as a moocher. That kind of rubbed me the wrong way because I'm like... What did it say? What did it, what, say? What did it say? Oh, what did it... Oh, that what I was plotting on my friend uh. for, um, what, financial support or something like that or basically trying to mooch and that I might be mooching on friends. Lorraine Austin probably wasn't any happier about the jury's guilty verdict and her sentence of 50 years to life behind bars. The bottom line on this case is the truth came out and they found Lorraine Austin guilty of murder and they sent her to prison for a, a very long time. She should never ever be allowed out of prison to where she could harm somebody again.